So I'm not sure whether I should say thank you for the introduction since I didn't understand anything that he said. Uh, but I've known John Louis for many, many years now and he's a very good friend, so I trust that he was uh, not too harsh uh, on me. Uh, it's a great pleasure to be here and tell you what we're doing in, uh, I'll use the term precision medicine and explain why the US is using that because President Obama uses that and NIH grant funding is now precision medicine. Uh, we used to call it genomics medicine or personalized medicine, it's all the same thing. Um, so I'll start with uh, the precision medicine was announced uh, in January of 2015 and President Obama's State of the Union address among many other topics had a very short introduction and then two weeks later had a press conference at the White House uh, to talk more about his idea for launching this major new research initiative in medicine. Uh, and it's basically to create a cohort of at least a million Americans who volunteered and give consent to participate in research uh, to donate blood, urine, other biologic samples uh, to allow genomic analysis, including whole genome sequencing. But key to this is these patients all are part of a healthcare system that has longitudinal retrospective clinical data and electronic healthcare uh, electronic medical record uh, and we're, are willing to participate in a prospective longitudinal st <coughs> uh, study and make their ongoing uh, health related information uh, available to it. Uh, the initial announcement came with a $215 million commitment for fiscal year 16 which is the current year we're in ending in June. Uh, we don't know yet what the budget going forward will be. Um, but there was, so that was in January of 15 and then in December of 2015, so now six months ago, uh, NIH put out a request for grant applications for healthcare provider organizations, healthcare systems. Uh, to recruit this one million US volunteers, they're going to fund seven health systems. Each health system has to enroll and consent 150,000 participants um, over a five-year period in the first year, consenting 10,000 people, and in the subsequent four years, 35,000 patients per year. Uh, grants were submitted in February. Geisinger Health System, which I'll tell you a little bit about, submitted a grant. They'll be reviewed in the next two weeks. So we'll know how we fared and funding is anticipated to start in July. The key message here is that we started building this precision medicine infrastructure and team uh, at least five years ago when I moved to Geisinger from Emory University Medical School at that time. Um, and they had started a biobank 10 years ago. So we've been building the infrastructure, building the biobank, building the team for 10 years ahead of the US precision medicine, anticipating at some point Francis Collins, who I worked with when he first went to the NIH as head of the Human Genome uh, Project, uh, I knew that he would at some point convince the federal government this was important and we should do a very large cohort study with sequencing. So let's come back to talk about Geisinger because many people even in the US have never heard of Geisinger as a health system because we're not a university, we're not an academic medical system, we're a freestanding healthcare provider which means we have hospitals, we have clinics and we're an insurance company as well all under a not-for-profit so we're not a commercial for-profit entity, we're a not-for-profit entity was founded in 1915 in Danville, Pennsylvania, which peaked at a population of 20,000 people and now has a population of 5,000 people, even though it's the headquarters of a $7 billion a year health system that has 30,000 employees, now about 2,000 physicians, uh, it's quite large. Uh, and it covers this region of central and northeastern Pennsylvania, this audience may not appreciate the uh, description of Pennsylvania that the political commentator in the United States, James Carville, um, once uh, famously said, 
Pennsylvania is Philadelphia to the east, Pittsburgh to the west, with Alabama in the middle, <laughs> meaning that the, we have two urban settings and everything else is very rural and small town. So our healthcare delivery is uh, mainly to a rural population, a total population of about three million people, uh, but no significant cities uh, in this region. So the largest city is Scranton, Pennsylvania, with about 100,000 people. Danville, as I said, has 5,000 people, and that's headquarters for our healthcare system. It's an integrated healthcare system, and by that I mean, we, this is a little bit outdated, closer to 2,000 physicians now, many <coughs> other nurses, nurse practitioners, other healthcare advanced practitioners. We have two large tertiary quaternary teaching hospitals, 40-something, uh, community-based primary care clinics that feed into these hospitals and specialty clinics. And we have our own insurance plan or health plan with about 5,000 members. So the overlap in our provider and health plan or insurance side is about a third, meaning we're not a closed system. So people can come to a Geisinger physician or hospital regardless of whose insurance you use. Uh, and our people who have our insurance can go to any hospital they want. So it's not like Kaiser in the U.S., for those of you who are familiar, which is a closed system. If you have Kaiser insurance, you have to go to a Kaiser doctor. We're, we're an open system. But about a third of our patients that we see for primary care and other care also have our insurance. It's those patients where we have the maximum amount of data, clinical data, insurance claims data, and we do a lot of our innovation and research on that overlap of ca uh, care provision, care provider, and health insurance. Now the key to the reason I went to Geisinger is really the previous CEO who was there for 15 years, an MD, PhD, academic surgeon, Glenn Steele, who grew up in the Harvard system, was head of surgery at the Deaconess Hospital at uh, Harvard, was an NIH investigator, had big NIH program project grants, was an immunologist, a PhD in immunology. <clears throat> he left uh, Harvard to go to the University of Chicago as dean of the medical school at University of Chicago and recruited me the first time to build a department of human genetics when he was at Chicago, which I did. We had a great working relationship for seven years and he called me into his office one day after seven years and said, guess what, I'm leaving, which was disappointing but not a surprise because he's a very prominent US healthcare um, expert thinker um, and was being recruited by all the top academic medical centers in the country. And we all expected that we would lose him at some point and he'd go back to Harvard in a bigger leadership position. And he said, I'm going to Geisinger. And I'd never heard of it. So I said, what is that? And where is that? And you have to explain your career trajectory <clears throat> to an academic snob. So you have success at Harvard, more success at University of Chicago, and then you go someplace I've never heard of. And he started describing what he viewed as the advantages of an integrated healthcare system that had adopted EPIC as their electronic medical record in 1996. So we now have 20 years of retrospective longitudinal uh, healthcare data on our population. So we were EPIC, which is now the largest vendor in the United States, and we were their second or third customer. But imagine then for the last 15 years, a healthcare system where the CEO referred to Geisinger not as a health system, but as his laboratory. So remember, he came from Harvard, University of Chicago, and he referred to Geisinger as his laboratory to do experiments, re-engineering healthcare to improve patient outcomes and to reduce the cost, the total cost of care by keeping patients out of the hospital if you prevent disease, keep them well, keep them out of the hospital, and keep them out of the emergency uh, department or emergency room. 
<laughs> so <clears throat> this was his very explicit. So I used to have president and CEO here, and I changed the title to indicate he's the principal investigator PI of this healthcare laboratory for 15 years. So he recruited me five years ago as the chief scientific officer ahead of research for this healthcare laboratory. When he called me at Emory to invite me to come visit Geisinger for the first time, we had worked together in Chicago for seven years, so I like to think he learned a lot about genetics. While he was dean at the medical school, we talked a lot about <laughs> genetics, and he understood the model of decode genetics in Iceland, that having for initial discovery research, having a relatively stable population with three generation families <coughs> and a relatively homogeneous genetic background was advantageous in the initial discovery phase. So he called me up in Atlanta, said, David, you have to come see this place. This is as close to Iceland as you can find in the United States. People don't move. The average family has been in the same house for more than 20 years. Um, and so uh, we have many three or more generation families, a total population of three million. We're essentially the only healthcare provider. So on the one hand, we're a monopoly. On the other hand, we have a close trusting relationship. We're the biggest employer in the region by far. So everybody has a relative or a friend who works for Geisinger and they're relatively good paying jobs. So a lot of positive connections between the communities, uh, integrated healthcare, uh, EPIC <coughs> implementation in 96. And then I was on an external advisory committee, scientific advisory committee, before I was finally convinced to move there. And we recommended starting a biobank in 2006, so now 10 years old. <clears throat> in 2010, the board of directors for this not-for-profit organization approved a research strategic <coughs> vision with a main emphasis on personalized healthcare, now called precision healthcare, with an emphasis on genomics, uh, coupled with their innovative integrated <coughs> system, provider and payer. Uh, and the goal was to see sort of when and how is individual genomic information useful in keeping people healthy, keeping them out of the hospital, re reducing the lifelong cost of healthcare. And in 2014, we did a uh, sort of midterm update, uh, a lot of discussions, and there's a trend in the United States going away from the nomenclature and treatment of uh, individuals in the healthcare system who volunteer for research. We used to call them human subjects. Then we called them uh, participants rather than subjects, which implied we were doing something to them that might be bad, to now using the nomenclature that there are partners. So we're all part of the team. And for some funding agencies in the United States, one called PCORI for Patient-Centered Outcomes Research, there's a requirement that one or more patients must be on the investigative team. So they have to be co-investigators designing the research and monitoring the progress of research. So they define what outcomes patients care about, not what physicians and other providers care about. So we've uh, embraced this participant engagement in research and also this concept of a learning healthcare system, again, <laughs> There's a new uh, ethical framework around clinical research developing in the United States. Instead of separating research from clinical care, this new framework is reintegrating clinical research and clinical care and says, in fact, that physicians and healthcare providers, hospital health systems, and even patients have a duty, not even an option, a duty to learn from all of the data generated as a byproduct of providing healthcare to patients. So as a healthcare system, we're committed to capturing as much data in the EHR and other clinical databases that are generated uh, as a byproduct of delivering high quality care, aggregating that data in a way that's accessible to do our, only, our own internal 
quality control metrics, um, our own operational efficiencies analysis, but also our own innovation and research to learn every day how to take better care of patients tomorrow. And this is a very interesting national ethical discussion for those of you familiar with um, the bioethics rules and the Belmont report from 1980. So the, the discussion and publications in this area, throw away the Belmont report, get rid of all this notion that the ethics board's job is to prevent researchers from doing evil, harmful things to patients, to a new model that says researchers, patients, and providers all share the same mission of learning how to keep people healthier. So why don't we figure out how to encourage and embrace that shared mission uh, of learning? So here's my individual vision statement in this integrated healthcare system is that universal genome sequencing will become a routine part of public health and medicine. And my advice to Francis Collins when Precision Medicine project was announced, I said, your goal at NIH should be to stop paying for DNA sequencing. If you paid for health services research, outcomes research, and health economics research to prove DNA sequencing had clinical utility and was cost effective, then the healthcare system would pay for sequencing on every patient. It wouldn't be research. And then the NIH research dollars would just be to capture that data and store that data for research purposes, but not to generate that data. So in the same way, our EHR captures free phenotypic data, I think we will approach a day and I don't know if it's five years or 10 years, where we sequence every patient and the research cost is just the data analysis of that free data. So it's always difficult, dangerous to speculate time. I think within 10 years, we could have clinical utility health economics data that says over an individual patient's lifetime, knowing their entire genome sequence will know at different ages what diseases they're most at risk and allow early intervention and prevention of many common diseases uh, and therefore will be cost uh, effective, cost beneficial. Ideally, we could incorporate this into newborn screening in the US. Newborn screening, we already have a good public health system where we get a dried blood spot on virtually every baby born. And that's plenty of DNA available in that dried blood spot to do whole genome sequencing on every baby. So if we just utilize that infrastructure for genome sequencing. And then <clears throat> in order for this to happen, we need to do more health services outcomes research to determine clinical utility and value means health economic uh, cost benefit ratio of genomic information. And my move to Geisinger five years ago was being convinced this was the ideal healthcare laboratory for this sort of implementation science research. So I challenged our IT people because Geisinger, like all big healthcare systems with electronic medical, talks about big data and healthcare. I said, well, how big is the data uh, in our electronic medical records? And at first they said, oh, I don't know, you can't calculate that. So I pushed and pushed and finally they gave me this chart plotted over the lifespan in five year intervals showing cumulative amount of data per person in their electronic medical record, excluding imaging data, which is very large uh, file sizes. And it wasn't very impressive. It's only about 23 megabytes of data per patient that actually sits in the electronic medical record over an entire lifespan. So it's not really by itself that big. So imagine now we sequence everybody at birth and you have whole genome sequence data, even if you only keep the variant files, so the differences between each person and the um, reference human DNA. You have about 10 gigabytes of individual information, millions of variants that uh, uh, identify individual variation across the genome. And now at every clinical encounter throughout life, 
you're generating genotype phenotype correlation for discovery research, but then at some point <coughs> our knowledge will improve on which of these variants put somebody at a much greater risk of cancer or a much greater risk of cardiovascular disease and what can we do about it if you know that ahead of time. So when I moved to Geisinger five years ago, again anticipating that Francis Collins and NIH would fund a large scale cohort with electronic medical records, I started recruiting people and coming from a medical genetics background, for me that meant physician, clinical geneticist, clinical diagnostic lab uh, experts and directors and master's degree genetic counselors. So this is the clinical team in medical genetics along with strong bioinformatics and bioethics uh, expertise. So in the last five years we have recruited five physician geneticists from different uh, mainly academic institutions around the United States and these are all hired primarily as full-time researchers not to do routine clinical care but to be part of this now precision medicine project. Uh, there are three uh, diagnostic lab and other laboratory experts including in biobanking and the biobank I told you started about 10 years ago operates now in a CLIA certified clinical laboratory environment and will be applying for College of American Pathology biobank certification. I've hired 20 genetic counselors. So imagine in Danville, Pennsylvania with 5,000 people have 20 genetic counselors all hired to participate in the research project both on the front end developing the educational materials for both patients and for primary care and other healthcare providers so they understand what this project is about and on the back end after we do exome sequencing which we're doing at the moment and we find pathogenic mutations in high risk cancer, cardiovascular, they are the ones who will meet with the patients and explain the genetic results and the implications for their health and uh, recommend referrals to appropriate oncology, cardiology or other clinical uh, specialists. Uh, bioinformatics, Marilyn Ritchie is a senior bioinformatics uh, person who's now recruited three other faculty to our brand new department of bioinformatics. In the United States there's a new fellowship training program for physicians in clinical informatics. So we have five physicians at Geisinger who are board certified in clinical informatics in addition to their internal medicine or pediatrics or pathology fellow, uh, residency training. They now have clinical informatics fellowship training. And so we immediately applied for a clinical informatics fellowship training program and were approved last year as one of the first 10 fellowship training programs in the United States in clinical informatics. Bioethics, we recruited a senior director who had been at Georgetown uh, and the NIH who's now recruited two other bioethics uh, faculty members. And then uh, Dan Davis has invited and put together an external bioethics advisory committee to this project including four national experts and four patient participants on this committee. Uh, I thought I had a slide on the membership. The chair of our bioethics uh, advisory committee is uh, Kevin Fitzgerald at Georgetown University who's interesting in that he's both a Jesuit priest and a PhD molecular geneticist, so quite an interesting uh, combination and understands the details of the genetic technology and information as well as uh, having a strong bioethics uh, background. So then five years ago we applied for our first NIH grant funding in genetics, something called the Emerge Project which is electronic medical records and genetics uh, information. This is a collaborative network of now 10 healthcare systems, mostly academic healthcare systems in the United States including Vanderbilt in Tennessee, the Mayo Clinic, Northwestern University, uh, part of Harvard Partners uh, and you see others that to do GWAS studies know that you need large sample sizes so you have 10 institutions that share their patients 
all their patients with diabetes, and then they have genome-wide SNP data on patients, so they share their phenotypic data and their uh, SNP genotype data, and it's been a very powerful research collaboration. We're also very involved in something called the ClinGen Project, or Clinical Genome Resource Project, which is a data sharing and data curation project. Some of you are aware of the difficulty with whole genome microarray and now exome sequences, the high frequency of identifying genomic variants that have never been seen before. We don't have enough information to understand their clinical um, relationship. Um, so we need to gather a lot more data and then have groups of expert curators to evaluate the clinical data, genomic data, and determine which genomic variants are pathogenic, which are benign and are in the normal population without any effects on your health, uh, and decrease and someday eliminate this bucket called variants of uncertain significance. So this is a very large collaborative project, and every time I talk, I like to show the U.S. labs that have agreed to donate their data, so share their genetic test result data and phenotype data into this um, data sharing, data curation project for the benefit of accelerating our knowledge on how to interpret this. So we call this the Hall of Fame list, and at Geisinger we have a formal institutional policy that we will not send genetic testing to a laboratory that does not share their clinical laboratory result and clinical result in this sort of data sharing project. <clears throat> I don't usually publicly show the other hall of shame list, the big labs that have lots of data who refuse to share it. I can call out Myriad since they publicly tell everybody that they view their data as proprietary and will not share any of their data to advance knowledge and improve patient care on a global level. Um, <clears throat> so I'll come back now to uh, our biobank started in 2006 and very early on related to this very unique trusting relationship between our patients, our community and Geisinger. When we invite people to participate in any research, including biobanking and genomics, our consent rates are very high. And typically for biobank and genomics, it's about 90%. Even the 10% who say no usually say, I'm in a hurry today, ask me next time. It's not that they don't want us to have their DNA or access their clinical information. Uh, it's more a matter of their convenience at the time. So very high consent rate. Uh, so this was very encouraging uh, at the time before I actually moved to Geisinger. And this was all with internal funding and very small scale initially. We set up a data broker system where all of the personal health information existed behind a firewall and only uh, credentialed data brokers have access to de-identified data. All the research community has to work through these data, data brokers in order to access uh, information, but do not receive personally identified information or get very limited uh, personal health information, not enough to be individually identified. There's a governing board that sits over access to the samples, and I'll update this in a minute. We've now uh, recruited and consented more than 100,000 patients out of our approximately 1 million active patients that we have uh, in our health system. One of the interesting things, because of the Epic Electronic Health Record, when we do the consent, we don't usually ask for a blood sample for the biobank. We simply put an order into Epic and their EHR. It says the next time this person goes to their physician and there's a clinical blood draw, when it goes, when that request goes to the lab, to the phlebotomy lab, they see that this patient has consented for my code, the biobank, and they get an extra tube that goes to the genomics core that sits in the CLIA environment. So it's almost free to get the sample after the consent process, it's just an extra tube. And that also means we get longitudinal samples. Every time the patient 
has a clinical blood draw, we get another tube of blood. For some chronically ill patients, we have uh, many, many blood samples uh, longitudinally. So we had started this um, biobank again before I got there, and then five years ago when I came to Geisinger and brought in some senior genetic counselors, we were talking about the original MyCode consent did not allow return of clinically actionable results to patients. We had separated research from clinical care. Because of this national discussion, we started to revisit that and said, well, we're a healthcare system. Our patients have consented to a research project. And when we did a whole series of focus groups about asking patients if we're going to generate genetic information and we find something that might be important to your health, do you want us to tell you? And virtually all of them said, yes, we want to know. And we trust you as our healthcare providers and you as Geisinger, you decide which information is relevant to my health. We trust you to do that. And in fact, in some of the focus group and some other published data, where the IRB consent form that people sign, says that you will not return results if you interview patients who have consented to a research protocol that says you will not give them back clinically relevant information, and you ask them, you're in this research study, if they find something relevant to your health, do you think they will return it to you? And they all answer, yes, of course, because I volunteered for research at my healthcare system, my hospital. If they find something medically important, they will tell me. And then you ask them, do you remember you signed a consent form that said we will not return clinically relevant. They say, yes, but we don't believe the form that we signed. If you find something important to my health, I know you will tell me. So the IRB, or Institutional Review Boards, or you call them ethics panels here, are playing this game and fooling themselves that people who sign a consent don't want the information, or if they sign that it's a research project and they won't get it, they fully expect that you will let them know if it's important to their health. <clears throat> so this uh, national discussion in the US about a duty to return research results that are clinically relevant um, is more respect, a more respectful way to engage research participants and partners and we thought as a health system, we had to modify our consent form. So we did this about five years ago. Uh, we had a series of focus group and asked people, well, what kind of information would you like back? And the majority of people said everything. We said, well, we're not ready to give you information if there's nothing we can do about it. So uh, APOE, Alzheimer's, things that you can't do anything about. We said, we're not going to return that to you. And they said, OK, you decide. You decide what to return to us that you think there's an evidence base and there's something clinically that we can do together. But you're the healthcare expert. You tell me what that is. Uh, oh, sorry. Here's the uh, external ethics advisory board and Kevin Fitzgerald chairing that. So. <clears throat> I got there five years ago. I started building this team. I thought NIH was going to announce a grant opportunity to sequence large cohorts like this. And for the first three years, they didn't. So while we were waiting, a pharmaceutical company called Regeneron Pharmaceuticals started a human genetics research center and built one of the largest DNA sequencing facilities in the world. And they shopped around different healthcare potential partners and said, we would like to do whole exome sequencing on 100,000 patients where there's good longitudinal electronic health information. So we signed a, an agreement with them in January of 2014 that got some um, press in the New York Times. It says George Yankopoulos, one of the founders of Regeneron uh, and the chief scientific officer, and this is when we initially announced a study of 100,000, but within the first few months, 
their sequencing capacity ramped up. Today they can sequence 2,000 patients per week. And with their support and help, we've expanded our number of recruiters. So we can recruit and consent 1,000 patients per week. We're trying to increase that further. So we said, we can do more than 100,000, let's do 250,000. So this was a year prior to President Obama's announcement of a million person cohort in all of the United States. Regeneron and one healthcare system in tiny little Danville, Pennsylvania said, let's do 250,000 uh, exome sequences. Uh, this shows our recruitment from when it was internally supported, relatively small, and then greatly accelerated in 2014 with uh, Regeneron's support. And we hit 100,000 uh, volunteers or uh, participants in uh, April last month. It's about 105 or 6,000 now. Uh, Regeneron has completed more than 60,000 exomes. We've done the quality control um, final analysis on a little over 50,000 of those participants, and we're doing a GWAS SNP chip uh, on these patients as well, but that's lagging behind a little bit time-wise. So here are some of the uh, features then of the cohort. Very high consent rate, 90%. Uh, total consented uh, over uh, 104,000. Uh, we got our IRB to approve our ability to use the patient portal, so the electronic patient portal where they make appointments, where they interact with their primary care doc, where they get lab results. <coughs> We're now allowed to advertise research studies through the patient portal, and then we're allowed with the mycogenomics project to have patients read about the project and to consent online. When we launch this without any advertisement, without any email alerts, um, a few weeks ago, we had 500 consents in the first 24 hours that just a new button popped up on the homepage of the patient portal. Now at that point, we didn't have it fine-tuned, it turned out about half of those patients had already consented. We didn't have a mechanism to say, oh, you've already consented, you don't need to consent again. Um, so we're fine-tuning that, but we expect to do more and more of the patient education, recruitment, and consenting in an online format for those patients who have good internet access and the uh, uh, sophistication to, to do that. Last year in 2015, we consented uh, about 40,000 patients. Our current rate, as I said, is about 1,000 a week, so we should be over 50,000 uh, this year. So a little bit more data on this. In the first 100,000, there's an average of 12 years retrospective EHR clinical data available per patient. Uh, so up to 20 years in some cases, but the mean <coughs> is 12 years. So almost 50 clinical encounters during that time, uh, <clears throat> over 450 lab values, and this is really important. Well, I'll talk a little bit later about familial hypercholesterolemia and getting more accurate lip, lip, uh, lipid profiles by having multiple measurements rather than just a single data point uh, isolated in time, uh, and almost 100 vital measurements uh, so if you compare our biobank or precision uh, health system with, uh, and actually now internal to Geisinger, not publicly yet, we think we can get at least 500,000 patients. We've already consented over 100,000. So when you compare other biobanks of similar size, they're countries rather than single healthcare systems. Um, but there's some key differences in the nature of the consent form and particularly the ability to recontact uh, patients. So for example, Vanderbilt in the US launched a large biobank that now has 200,000 biospecimens in their biobank, but they started with an opt-out procedure, which means all patients were automatically enrolled. 
unless they proactively said, do not include me in your biobank. And the NIH Bioethics Committee has said, no, nope, that's not good enough. You can't participate in precision medicine or any NIH grant funding unless you have a full opt-in consent mechanism. So Vanderbilt has to start all over again, reconsenting all of their 200,000 patients. Um, but even with that modified consent, the Vanderbilt Ethics Review Board said, you're not allowed to recontact a patient. So even if you find a BRCA1, BRCA2 pathogenic mutation, you can't tell them. Those of you who follow Decode and Kari Stephenson know his frustration that he knows every person and family in Iceland with BRCA1, BRCA2 pathogenic mutations and can't tell them that they're at increased risk for breast and ovarian cancer. So this is a major difference uh, across different biobanks. And then individualized return of clinically actionable, I think we have one of the broader um, programs and ethics review board consents uh, in this area, and it's not being done in some of the other major biobanks. So if you look at all of these features, I think there are few, maybe no other US or international biobank that has all of these elements, although all of these elements are a requirement for the new US precision medicine. So our colleagues around the US wrote a grant application and I said that we're gonna do this despite the fact they have not yet convinced their local ethics review board to approve uh, several of these key elements. So will be interesting politics between their institutional desire to accept an, a major NIH grant and their local ethics review board that says, no, we won't allow you to do that. So, uh, so we've published a description of our uh, biobank and some of the initial focus group information, our discussions with our patients about what kind of information uh, they're interested in. Uh, there's been one publication, not from the entire 50,000 exomes, but at about 43,000 exomes, Regeneron Pharmaceutical had a particular interest in the angiopoietin-like uh, 4 gene and its relationship to coronary artery disease. In our population, we found about 1,700 clear inactivating variants um, that showed a 13% reduction in triglyceride levels across the 1,700, increased HDL levels, and a significant reduction in coronary artery disease with odds ratio of 0.81 compared to those without inactivating variants. We have a whole series of publications now under review that um, I'll just pick a couple of examples to talk about. So, but again, as a healthcare system and a medical genetics team, how do we decide what's clinically actionable? What are we gonna to return to our patients? So we're taking advantage of the American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics that had an expert panel that reviewed uh, the literature of genes and diseases and with very, very conservative criteria um, <clears throat> for primarily dominant, autosomal dominant monogenic conditions with evidence of very high penetrance where there was some clinically actionable uh, result to prevent breast ovarian cancer, prevent colon cancer, prevent uh, cardiac events, uh, MIs, based on this information. So we started with that list of 56 gene disease pairs that had been published uh, on this original uh, American College of Medical Genetics and Genomics Committee. There were two Geisinger faculty members and Krista Martin at Geisinger is now the chair of this committee, which is updating this list. People can nominate new gene disease pairs where evidence is uh, sufficiently high or they can challenge those that are currently on the list. Uh, if we do a calculation out of 250 exome sequences based on published rate of so-called incidental or secondary findings. So healthy, if we sequence healthy individuals like the audience here, 
Um, <coughs> data suggests that 2 to 4 percent will have a pathogenic mutation in one of these 56 gene disease pairs that puts you at significantly higher risk of cancer or cardiovascular disease. So if we just do the numbers from this estimate, that means from our first 250,000, we're going to find 5 to 10,000 study participants at risk that we need to provide genetic counseling to and refer for appropriate medical evaluation. But since these are mainly autosomal dominant conditions, we're also going to find three to five or six relatives, although many of the relatives will also volunteer for the research. So you have a multiplier effect when you do cascade evalua evaluation and testing of first degree relatives. So in this research project, we're going to find 20 to 40,000 people in our healthcare system at significantly increased risk for breast, ovarian, colon cancer, um, and early cardiac events. So here are just the most common diseases, familial hypercholesterolemia, where the best current population prevalence rates are about one in 250. Uh, <coughs> hereditary breast and ovarian cancer, one in 400. Lynch syndrome, about one in 400 as well. So just these three categories and the genes associated is about 1% of the general population. So <clears throat> we've chosen to focus our analysis and our counseling uh, on these, and this is the list of genes involved. And if I just showed data from familial hypercholesterolemia, we're finding about 1 in 215 in the Geisinger population have clear loss of function mutations in LDLR, PCSK9, and APOB, so 1 in 215. <clears throat> and then if we look into the EHR clinical data on these uh, individuals, we, s we can make a clinical diagnosis of familial hypercholesterolemia based on their lipid profiles sitting in the electronic medical record, but Almost none of these patients have a known clinical diagnosis. In the United States, I don't know about France, it's estimated that we only make a clinical diagnosis of FH in about 10% of people who have the disease. Uh, in um, uh, some other countries, the percentage clinical diagnosis is much higher. So this demonstrates very high penetrance. And only 10% of the time does the lipid profile EHR data look completely normal. So there's a gray zone uh, in between. <clears throat> so if I just show a couple of cases, one is a familiar hyper or an LDLR variant where we initially looked at it and were, it was a missense mutation, so not sure whether it would be pathogenic or not. And <clears throat> this is the predicted pedigree, not confirmed, but predicted by a software program called Primus, showing uh, individuals who have positive family history of coronary artery disease with the mutation and LDA, LDL levels consistent, another positive family history and uh, elevated uh, LDL. Uh, using this um, Primus pedigree prediction algorithm, and then we'll call these individuals in and confirm the uh, family uh, history, family relationships. When we go to ClinVar, one of the major databases now containing variants where laboratories submit it and then they submit with it a clinical interpretation or classification as pathogenic, this one has conflicting interpretations on pathogenicity, including likely benign, pathogenic, and uncertain. Uh, significance for the identical missense mutation we saw uh, in our family. <clears throat> so in this predicted missense variant involving 23 individuals, probably related, in our cohort, the EHR data showed 65% of individuals with this missense mutation meet criteria for FH based on EHR data alone. Um, <clears throat> And um, <clears throat> so there's more phenotype, genotype data available in this 
single healthcare cohort than all of the published literature and databases. So we think that as we contribute uh, our CLIA confirmed clinical, we're generating clinical reports, and then we will donate that data into ClinVar and other public databases. It will quickly add a lot of data on pathogenic versus benign variants in the same genes that we're delivering back to our patients. A second quick example in BRCA1 in May of 2013, most will be aware that Angelina Jolie disclosed her prophylactic uh, mastectomy based on her positive BRCA1 result, which prompted a 33-year-old woman at that time in the Geisinger system to come in uh, to inquire about testing for BRCA1 because of uh, breast cancer in a family member. She met with one of our high-risk cancer clinic genetic counselors who took her family history uh, and then determined that because it was only a single family member with breast cancer that she did not meet criteria to recommend genetic testing for BRCA1 and 2 at that time. But then she enrolled in MyCode, had her exome sequenced as part of this research project, uh, and had a positive BRCA1 result. So she was brought in for counseling uh, and discussions. At that point, told us the story that she had been worried about this, but didn't meet criteria and qualify for genetic testing uh, two years previously. So this is an example uh, that <coughs> we're essentially getting information from a general population study uh, on BRCA1 and 2, and then by getting other family history and personal medical history will contribute to when will we have enough data on BRCA1 and 2 to follow Mary Claire King's controversial proposal from a year or so ago that we should be doing general population screening for um, dominant highly penetrant genes like uh, BRCA1 and 2 uh, to save lives by allowing women to be managed more closely for breast cancer and colon cancer. So our short-term goals in this research project are find every patient and family member in Geisinger with familial hypercholesterolemia determine the optimum age and method of treatment with statins or the new PCSK9 inhibitors. What I'm excited about with this opportunity is in the US, the American Academy of Pediatrics has a published guideline that if you're in a known FH family, that children should be evaluated, tested, and treatment started if positive, either by lipid profile or by genetic mutation, uh, treatment should be started by age eight in order to prevent the earth early atherosclerotic deposits. So the early heart attacks start in your 30s or 40s for men, in your 50s for women, but the heart damage starts at age eight. So if you want to keep the heart healthy, you need to know about it and take measures to keep cholesterol down and prevent atherosclerotic buildup in children. And then we wanna find every person with BRCA1 and 2 mutation for early monitoring detection of breast cancer. And we have pretty good monitoring uh, for breast cancer, not so good with ovarian cancer. So might this be a good population to be looking at <coughs> so-called liquid biopsies or looking at circulating tumor DNA and peripheral blood. So this would be a high risk population. Sequence uh, the exome or sequence the peripheral blood to identify low levels of tumor genomic profile uh, in these patients. And then of course, move on to other diseases beside these most common Mendelian disorders. So I'm gonna close there and thank my colleagues uh, at Geisinger, but also particularly the very strong scientific uh, genetics team at the Regeneron Genetics Center uh, in New York. And I'm hoping that I've provoked some questions and comments from the audience, and I think we have time to, to
to entertain questions and have a discussion. So thank you very much.